yeah um, um hello everyone uh, welcome to the first uh, annual nujs uh, slcu ilsa guest lecture and uh, we are very very pleased to have professor christian tams with us for the very first edition of this lecture and without further ado i'd like to hand over the floor to professor jaydevan nayar the dean of the school of law christ university bangalore to begin with the opening remarks for this lecture uh, thank you respected professor christian j tams professor of international law university of glasgow back faculty advisors dr atul alexander dr rohit roy and viplav banwal esteemed faculty and dear students who are attending this event today's event is a reiteration of the intent of the school of law prized deemed to be university to adhere to high standards that advances excellence in professional legal education in india in partnering with nujs calcutta and the international law students association we are working to realizing global standards and setting new standards in legal education for instance the national education policy uh, rolled out by the government of india speaks about global competitiveness of law schools in the country my appreciation to the efforts of the organizers of this event and for this initiative and i am sure that there will be many more occasions of this nature in the future our resolve is to organize more such events that will enrich the students and the faculty alike thank you uh so it gives me immense pleasure uh to uh, introduce professor christian day thams uh who's uh, a doyen scholar in the field of international law and uh, his accomplishments when i was going through his cv and profile uh it ran into pages so what i have done is i have only condensed and i'm only presenting some of his uh, major achievements so firstly uh, i would uh, place on record my sincere thanks to christian tams for accepting our invitation so to briefly introduce uh, professor uh, christian tams uh, he is the founding director of the glasgow center of international law and uh, security and uh, leads the erasmus mundus masters on international law global uh, security peace and development tams uh, studied in kiel uh, leon and cambridge and he is a qualified german lawyer and in fact he has authored and edited more than 17 books uh, in the field of international law and most of the publications are from cambridge university press and he has chapter uh, uh, on themes like international law new law german constitution etc and in the year 2005 uh, his pioneering work that is enforcing obligation erga omnes Uh, which would be the topic of discussion today uh, won the york prize and in the year 2017 he was also the author of this uh, statute of the international court of justice a commentary which is uh, i would say one of the most referred books for any uh, student of international law and also recently he has contributed uh, on self defense against non state actors and he is also in the review uh, he is also the review editor of the european journal of international law apart from his academic uh, prowess he has also uh, acted uh, in proceedings before the international court of justice the iran us claims tribunal and ar other arbitral tribunals notably the investment claims so the topic uh, that would be uh, discussed uh, the topic that would be discussed today is on uh, enforcing obligations erga omnes which i feel is something that needs to be discussed and deliberated now what i'll be doing is i'll be giving uh, in a minute's time a brief uh, overview of what uh, what would be discussed uh, in the talk then i'll hand it over to uh, professor christian tam uh, so for starters international law is based on consent reciprocity voluntarism and uh, we say we associate international law with unilateral obligation bilateral obligation and we also have something called as erga omnes obligation that can flow from treaty customs international law and even justogens uh, uh, even justogens 
Now, the entire notion of ergonomic obligation uh, got its uh, uh, kick started uh, after the famous dictum in the Barcelona traction case, paragraph 32 and 33. And further, in the cases of East Timor and the wall advisory opinion, uh, the notion of ergonomic obligation uh, seeped into the spheres of uh, right to self determination. And it is all about, uh, today's discussion is all about how this erga on this obligation is to be enforced. And this, this topic is also relevant today because we are witnessing a scenario that uh, Gambia has taken Myanmar to the International Court of Justice by invoking this obligation. So in order to uh, unlock and decipher the entire uh, notion of erga on this obligation in terms of uh, enforcement, we have today with us, as I introduced, Professor Christian De Tams from University of Glasgow, uh, who would be shedding light into uh, some of the finer aspects of enforcement of obligation ergonomics. So I hand it over to uh, Professor Christian De Tams. Uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, Professor would be delivering this talk for 45 minutes to 50 minutes. Uh, he, uh, uh, he could also e extend it a bit longer. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's discretion. Then we'll have around uh, Q and A for 15 to 20 minutes. Either you could post your questions in the chat box or you could directly ask to uh, ask your questions to the professor. So with this uh, brief introduction, I would uh, like to hand it over to Professor Christian J. Tams. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alexander. Thank you, Dean Nair. It's been a, it's a privilege to be introduced by the two of you and it's a privilege to speak to all of you on, uh, on this format today and to deliver the annual NUJS SLCU ILSA lecture. I'm grateful to Christ University and I'm to also to NUJS Calcutta. And I'm grateful, as I was saying, to the words, uh, to, to the, the Dean and Professor Alexander for the kind words of introduction. If there's one regret I have, is, it is this, that I'm speaking to you from a rainy and windy and indeed stormy Europe. I've put on headphones because I thought there was such so much noise from the wind outside that perhaps for the audio uh, quality, it would be better. Um, but I can say to you that looking out of my window, it is a frightening view that I have into storm and rain. And I hope it's different. I assume it's different to where you are based. And I wish I could be with you, not just uh, via uh, an online format, but in person. I, I trust that perhaps we will have opportunities in the future as our collaboration continues to to address that and meet uh, whether it's in Europe, uh, in, in India or elsewhere. Now, the topic uh, that you have selected for me is one that, as you were hinting at in your introduction, is one that takes me back to my days of youth, the old days when I felt uh, fresh and fit uh, long ago now. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's not just with a feeling of nostalgia that I'm speaking uh, to this topic or that I'm coming back to this topic, but also with a feeling of the continued relevance of the topic of obligations ergo omnes as you have just introduced it. Because, and here I begin my substantive remarks, for half a century now, indeed, that concept has been of relevance and it has also fascinated international lawyers, whether that's in India, in The Hague or elsewhere, or even young doctoral students like myself at some point. To many, uh, the concept of obligations ergo omnes stands for the promise of international law. Judge Antonio Cantado Trindade, one of the judges of the World Court, recently wrote about it that erga omnis obligations, and I'm quoting, heralded the advent of the international legal order of our times, committed to the prevalence of superior common values, end of quote. Now, that is one view, but it's only one view. Others see the concept as reflecting something that's bad about international law a fondness for glossy terms that are not backed up by real interests. So the concept of ergo omnis obligations appears like an empty gesture, not really meaning much, a fancy Latin term, and I'll say something about that in a second, but nothing tangible. So what does it then mean for an obligation to be owed ergo omnis? How does it matter if it matters at all? These are the questions that I would like to discuss to you, uh, with you uh, in, the next, uh, in the next 45 minutes initially and then through questions and answers. And let me perhaps begin by saying that the concept can be quite daunting. It has an almost mythical feel to it, certainly in international law circles. In debates, if you mention erga omnis obligations, it can change the atmosphere. People nod gravely, sounds impressive, 
um, this must be serious business, if only because it's in Latin terms. But it also is perhaps a bit confusing. Ian Brownlee, uh, a famous British international lawyer who was anything but fond of Latin concepts, he said that the notion of ergo omnis obligations was very mysterious indeed, and he didn't mean that all too kindly. Um, but because it's so very mysterious, many scholars, uh, disciples, students of international law and practitioners of international law approach the concept with trepidation and hesitation. Um, now, the main message for the next 45 or 40 minutes is that this is not necessary. This is not a concept that in should inspire fear or trepidation. It is not all that complicated, in fact, and perhaps it's not even that mysterious. There's no need to be afraid. We can engage with it. We should engage with it. It is meaningful. It is tangible. And so in some ways, what follows in the next 45 minutes is an invitation to demystify a concept that is too often considered to be complicated and mysterious. So the journey of demystification, and uh, Atul, you've mentioned it already in opening, begins uh, with the Barcelona attraction judgment. A judgment rendered in the February of um, 1970, more than a half century ago, when many of you on this call were not even close to being born. Um, it is one of the more curious cases that had nothing to do on the face of it with common interests or a value-based international order, um, but it's an instructive case. Um, in many case, uh, in many ways, the Barcelona traction, uh, Barcelona traction case is curious. In retrospect, we remember it if we're students of international economic law as a conservative restatement uh, of the nationality of corporations. We are perhaps fond of, well, not so fond of remembering it if we're students of the ICJ as an exercise in very bad case management. This case ran on for decades only to end on a formal note of dismissal. It could have been handled a lot more efficiently and even the ICJ today would handle it, a case like this, a lot more efficiently. But the most lasting legacy is the Erga Omnis legacy of the Barcelona Traction Judgment. And as you were noting in opening, it is found in two curious paragraphs of the judgment in which the court drew a distinction between two types of obligations under international law. And I will briefly introduce that. So these are the two types of obligations that the International Court of Justice saw. First of all, uh, obligations uh, owed to foreign states regarding the treatment uh, by a host state of foreign nationals and foreign companies. These first types of obligations, said the ICJ, were, I quote, neither absolute nor unqualified, end of quote, and they arose, again a quote, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, another state in the field of diplomatic protection, end of quote. The second type of obligation is different. Uh, they were not so limited. There was, in the words of the court, an essential distinction. The second category comprised obligations, and I quote again, obligations owed by a state towards the international community as a whole, which, continuing the quote, by their very nature are the concern of all states. And still continuing the quote, these very prominent uh, aspects of the ICJ's decision, in view of the importance of the rights involved, all states can be held to have a legal interest in their protection. And here comes the famous phrase, they are obligations, erga omnis. So two categories, one owed to other states in the field of diplomatic protection and other fields, the others owed to the international community as a whole, all states having a right in seeing them protected. Now, since 1970, in the half century, this has become part of the canon of international law. It's found in the textbooks, it's found in articles, it's referred to all the time. Commentators have dissected every comma of the court's curious statement or of the curious passage uh, that follows where the court refers to certain examples and says that um, rules against genocide, against aggression, and the principles of rules concerning the basic human rights uh, from freedom from slavery and racial discrimination would be uh, qualified as such obligations, ergo omnis. Now, I don't propose to rehearse all those arguments, but merely add that the passage contained in the Barcelona Attraction Judgment, while it was not really relevant to the decision of the case uh, by the court, was not really accidental. This is sometimes said that the court just wanted to add uh, a few paragraphs to make people feel good, 
But there was strategic thinking behind that, as is clear to anybody who studied the background to the judgment uh, carefully. Um, Judge Manfred Lachs from Poland, who is considered to be one of the uh, thinkers behind this passage, later said that the Barcelona traction case had provided the ICJ with a, quote, good opportunity to nail down certain provisions of the law, end of quote. And nailing down the law on the aspect of ergo omnis was indeed something the court in 1970 was well advised to do. Why that? Because only three years later, or three and a half years later, in another, oh, sorry, earlier, in another famous judgment, the South West Africa case, the court seemed to have ruled out any such thing as the possibility of obligations in, which protect, in whose protections all states could have a legal interest. In the famous or infamous Southwest Africa litigation, the ICJ had rejected the attempt by Ethiopia and Liberia to seek the judicial control of South Africa's, apartheid South Africa's mandate in what is now Namibia. Um, and it had rejected those attempts to get a judicial scrutiny of this by relying on legal interest. And it said that Liberia and Ethiopia had no legal interest in seeking scrutiny of South Africa's conduct elsewhere because they had no standing. Anything else, said the court in 1966, um, uh, would have been, in the view of the court, the equivalent of admitting an actio popularis, another fancy Latin term, the idea that you could bring proceedings on behalf of the international, of, of the community to which you belong. Um, now, in 1970, when rendering the Barcelona traction judgment, the court didn't expressly disavow this earlier judgment, but it's very clear that, while not expressly, in substance, it did. And for good reason. Southwest Africa, the judgment rendered uh, on the day that would later be my birthday, 18th of July, 1966, um, was a disaster for the court. It was a PR disaster, as the late Judge James Crawford would observe. It was also an institutional um, and a political disaster. The world reacted outside narrow circles in Europe and North America with shock and horror at the clear decision by the court to close the door to a well-intentioned attempt to use the world court to seek some scrutiny of conduct of an apartheid regime uh, in a proto or para-colonial setting uh, in the M Namibia context. Um, it was high time three and a half year later, years later for the court, at least the progressive members of it, to seek a good opportunity in Manfred Lachs's term to renege on that earlier statement. They couldn't do it expressly because that would have been too open, but everybody knew at the time what it meant. Barcelona traction was an attempt to save face to move away from the disaster that had been the Southwest Africa judgment, the narrow pronouncement on standing. Now, that context is important, and it remains important 50 years later, and this is why I'm speaking to it, even though you might say this is the old stuff, because it highlights the setting in which the notion of obligations ergo omnis emerged. Things are not that mysterious if we look with a clear eye to this. It was a form, of a notion, a concept, a formula that was coined in the context of legal proceedings where one state that had not an immediate, direct, subjective, individual interest in the matter was trying to hold another state accountable. We're talking about rights of protection, protection through access to courts, the vindication of international law, perhaps in an untechnical sense, we might say the enforcement of international law. Now, this may seem trite, but it does matter um, because it allows us to delineate the notion of erga omnis obligations uh, as formulated from the, by the ICJ in Barcelona Traction um, from other approaches. And if you want to put it flippantly, or if you, if you bear with me as I'm putting it flippantly, it allows us to distinguish the erga omnis wheat from the erga omnis chaff. And there is quite a lot of erga omnis chaff, because, partly because we find it mysterious, partly because it sounds fancy. This concept is used in very many, very different contexts. Something often 
entirely unrelated to the, ergo, to, to the Barcelona traction judgment. Ergo omnis literally means towards all in Latin. Um, and so an obligation ergo omnis is owed towards all. Um, but that doesn't really uh, offer a much, much precision. And so in very many con concepts and contexts, that notion of an ergo omnis obligation is thrown around very differently from the Barcelona attraction case. So to just give you two examples, if we're talking about title to territory, does the island that you dispute with your neighboring state belong to you or the other? Whatever decision is taken, the title to territory will be valid against all. If the island belongs to state A, it's theirs. If the island belongs to state B, it's theirs. But while that may be decided in a relative, in a treaty, in a judgment, the effect will be towards all. Title to territory, as Judge Huber said uh, in, the, in the Palmas arbitration a century ago, almost a century ago, title to territory is valid erga omnis. So you have the same terms, but in a very different context. Same for judgments. It's sometimes said that courts can develop the law through their pronouncements. They have operative paragraphs with determ which determine uh, the issues at stake but their pronouncements will, through precedent or persuasive precedent, um, determine questions of interpretation. And this will be valid not just to the parties in litigation, but to other states or entities that appear before the court. This will be a definitive pronouncement uh, on the interpretation of the law. And again, that is not restricted to the parties. That is owed or valid vis-a-vis -vis all. And again, it's frequently referred to in the scholarship on the development of international law by courts as an erga omnis effect. Now, none of this is wrong. Quite to the contrary, it shows um, this is how erga omnis was used well before the Barcelona traction judgment. But it's different. And that's the only point I want to make. It's not that you cannot call these effects erga omnis effects, but we need to be, if we want to understand the obligations erga omnis concept in the way uh, Professor Alexander was introducing it to us, we need to distinguish the two. Um, so erga omnis obligations in the sense of the Barcelona traction judgment are not about the reach of a primary obligation as in title to territory, not about the effects of a judgment. We're looking at law enforcement at the vindication of the law at proceedings before the ICJ. And you might say that given that the term had been used so frequently and that the term erga omnis is capable of so many meanings, it was somewhat unwise for the ICJ to squeeze it again, to use it in that context again. Um, in retrospect, there would have been a lot better terms to describe the effects, but the ICJ did what it did. It came with good motivations, undoing, reneging on Southwest Africa, and it just chose to use erga omnis ter terminology without, if I may be so bold, probably having thought it through all to the end. And the term has stuck. Um, and my basic point, my initial point, well, not the initial point, but my first important point, I think, for students of international law is don't be blinded just by the words. If we're talking about obligations ergo omnis, pay attention to the context and use the term obligations ergo omnis in this law enforcement, judicial vindication of rights setting. Okay, now with that out of the way, as it were, the wheat distinguished from the chaff, let us have a closer look at the enforcement side of obligations ergo omnis, and let us discuss how it specifically might affect the enforcement of international law. This is an aspect on which much discussion on ergo omnis obligations has centered, but there is a lot of disagreement. There remains a lot of disagreement. Um, and I think it reflects different uh, approaches to the notion that I was hinting at at the beginning. Some see this really as the, the magic weapon. This will help us overcome the weaknesses and strictures of international law. Some are much less prone to relying or projecting hopes on, on fancy terms. Um, to put names to it, as I was saying at the beginning, Judge Cansado Trindade's view on the Ergo Omnis concept and the hope he brings, uh, he projects on it, are miles away from, let's say, the approach of Judge Shui uh, from China, who in a recent case that I think you refer to, the Gambia uh, Myanmar Provisional Measures Order, voiced um, significant reservations about whether 
um, Erga Omnis really delivered much to the enforcement of international law. Um, so let's discuss it, because this is where the debate is. This is also where the relevance of the concept resides. And what I propose to do in the remainder of this talk, maybe another half an hour or so, is look at two potential enforcement effects. One, I would say, is the core, the question of litigation about erga omnis obligations. The other is not the core, perhaps the penumbra, perhaps an analogy, uh, certainly a separate field, but perhaps more relevant, namely whether erga omnis obligations do anything to the enforcement of international law outside courts by decentralized coercive means, and whether states relying or seeking to defend erga omnis interests can use coercive means against other states. I'll deal with those two points uh, in turn, and after that I'll wrap up quickly and we can have a discussion to which I look forward to. So first step then, the core, the core of legal proceedings. Um, the core because this is where the concept originated. Um, what can erga omnis obligations do to judicial proceedings? The simple, pro the, the straightforward or the underlying proposition is simple. Uh, I won't read to you again the words that the court used, but perhaps they're still fresh in your mind or perhaps you'd read them before. If all states have an interest in seeing er obligations erga omnis protected, um, then perhaps they all have standing to bring proceedings if such rights are being trampled upon, violated, if such obligations uh, are disregarded. Now, this would be significant because in the normal run of things in international law, and I think you've uh, hinted at that uh, in, in opening, Professor Alexander, um, we think of obligations as bilateral obligations, or at least traditionally, this is how international law was conceptualized, running between pairs and states, even perhaps where the rules were multilateral, take the context of diplomatic relations, the obligations would only ever really arise between pairs of states, the sending state and the receiving state in diplomatic relations, or even where we have a multilateral trading order, the benefits are granted between pairs and states states importing and states exporting. Now, in that setting, um, standing would limit the question of who can act in enforcement and to enforce rights. So to take random examples, of course, under this traditional paradigm, India can take Pakistan to the world court if it is concerned about the treatment of one of its nationals, such as Mr. Jadaf in the Jadaf case. Of course, in that traditional paradigm, India, reverse, can be taken to court by Italy if the dispute is about the treatment of an Italian ship or marine officers active on that ship, as in the Enrico Lexi dispute between Italy and India. We don't need erga omnis obligations to explain any of that. But what about then other states? Not all cases quite fit this pattern. What about states engaging in breaches where there is no immediate obvious claimant violating human rights at home, violating rights of their citizens. Who would be the obvious claimant? We don't have him or her or it. Or even still, assume that there is a bilateral cross-border context, but the rule is, is of such magnitude that all states should have an interest uh, in seeing it observed. Think of the current crisis, which at the moment dominates European and world news, a war of aggression waged against Ukraine. We do have an obvious claimant in all law enforcement activities, which is Ukraine. But maybe we don't want to reduce the circle of potential claimants to Ukraine. Maybe other states also have an interest, a legal interest, in, see, in having Russia observe international law. And maybe judicial proceedings are one way of uh, vindicating the law. This is the core because this is what the ICJ in Barcelona traction talked about. But the idea that, and I think that the natural reading of the passage that I was paraphrasing to you sort of 10, 20 minutes ago, is that indeed in these settings where we have an obligation or omnis, as a matter of course, all states should have standing to initiate proceedings. There used to be quite some opposition to that. Wouldn't we encourage busy bodies to litigate would it be too easy to litigate the typical sort of, um, sort of where does it end if you permit that thin end of the wedge type argument? Would this be an actio popularis? Would state just end up 
suing each other all the time, uh, isn't that dangerous? Is that advisable? These were some of the concerns, I'm putting them in rather more flippant terms, that were voiced against the Ergo Omnis concept for, for many, many years and indeed decades. Now, in retrospect, I think these have been rearguard actions. Um, even in the ICJ's case law, the trend is away from strict individual constructions of legal interest. You have a number of ICJ pronouncements that significantly show that the Barcelona attraction dictum is meant to be taken at face value. They have been of more recent vintage, but they are there. So to take two or three examples, some of you may have read about the Habre case in which uh, Belgium sued uh, Senegal over the treatment of a former dictator. And the question was about torture. What was Belgium's interest? Well, the court seemed absolutely open to the idea that Belgium could bring a case on various grounds, but including also because as a party to the anti-torture convention, it had a general interest and uh, the anti-torture convention imposed obligations ergo omnis and Belgium therefore as a simple member of the convention could initiate proceedings where it felt the convention had been breached. A second case, the whaling case, in which Australia and New Zealand sued Japan over the catch of whales in the Southern Ocean. Um, lots of technical detail in that case, but a very basic question. Japan wasn't catching whales in Australian waters, but on the high seas. Why would Australia, why could Australia care why could Australia sue Japan over this uh, if Japan, even if Japan was violating international law on the high seas? Well, the court hardly spent time with it. It assumed that Australia could do so, but the underlying rationale is that Australia could do so because there was a common interest in seeing, uh, in ensuring the protection of, a, of an endangered species against ex extinction. Um, the final case is the one that had been mentioned by Professor uh, Alexander in opening, uh, the Gambia suing Myanmar. This is perhaps the clearest example that you could think of. This is something that is happening a lot closer to where you are based, the treatment or mistreatment of the Rohingya minority uh, in, in Myanmar. So I will not pretend to be telling you what is happening. Uh, you have a far more acute view of the issues. But from the perspective of law enforcement, it is both striking and accepted that the Gambia can initiate litigation on behalf of the Rohingya people uh, in relation to claims that these Rohingya people are mistreated, um, perhaps even amounting to genocide, by the government and the uh, supporting forces and the military of Myanmar. Whatever the merits of that claim, it's the Gambia, one of the tiniest states in Africa, thousands of miles away, that initiates proceedings. What is its interest? Presumably no Rohingya had ever visited the Gambia before the case was brought. So the interest that the Gambia brought was an erga omnis interest. The duty not to commit genocide is an obligation erga omnis. It encourages public interest litigation. The Gambia in this state was taking up the matter. And at least at the provisional measures phase, the court in a unanimous provisional measures order upheld its prima facie jurisdiction to deal with this matter and upheld, uh, at least initially, the Gambia standing, it, uh, the matter is still pending, but the signs are very clear that the Gambia's claim will not fail on the question of standing. And Judge Shue from China, the, the, the court's vice president, whom I mentioned 10 minutes ago, expressed concerns or hesitation, but did not dissent from that order. So it seems to me that the initial opposition to this idea of obligations ergo omnis uh, at the core, when we're looking at judicial proceedings, um, is now giving way. And international lawyers are beginning to internalize, to accept the idea that obligations ergo omnis mean what they have always meant, what the court meant them to mean 50 years ago, namely a recognition that for a finite type of obligations, for a finite group of, of obligations, a small group of obligations protecting heightened community interests, standing will not have to follow traditional bilateral individual patterns. You can initiate litigation on behalf of the international community as a whole, and every, each and every individual state can do so. I'll make 
two more remarks on this core aspect, um, which try to contextualize it. One is that it seems to me, perhaps it was never quite so dramatic. Um, certainly for the first decades, erga omnes obligations were not only considered mysterious, but also revolutionary. Um, and perhaps they are not. Because while this marks a significant extension, a broadening of standing to sue, it's not that this had never been done before. A century ago, uh, I mean, it had never been done as, about, as an erga omnis type uh, category. But the idea that you can initiate proceedings even where it's difficult to identify individual subjective rights that are at stake and form the subject of the litigation is not so dramatically new. A century ago, in the first ever interstate case uh, decided by, by a permanent international court, the Wimbledon case, um, the, permanent international, the Permanent Court of International Justice had little trouble in admitting claims by four states against Germany for a breach of neutrality rules and a passage through a German canal. One of these four states was Japan, half a world away, whose only relation to the case was its membership in the treaty that had required Germany to open the canal to the world. There were no Japanese ships to be seen. Um, this was well before the Japanese merchant shipping began to conquer, in inverted commas, the globe. But Japan in 1923 could bring proceedings because the Permanent Court of International Justice in its first ever, contentious in its first ever judgment in a contentious case had a significantly liberal vision of standing. Membership in the treaty meant something. Germany had agreed vis-a-vis -vis all treaty parties to keep the canal open. So Japan, even in the absence of any Japanese shipping or any interference with a Japanese ship, could initiate proceedings. Its standing was not a problem. Um, and I think if we look more closely, we see many treaties that uh, have been construed liberally in that sense. If you look at human rights treaties um, at the regional context, they protect rights of individuals. They typically permit interstate applications. And again, it's not necessary to show that your individual interests as a state are violated. So perhaps the ergo omnis concept is not quite as dramatic as some of my colleagues uh, made it sound or as notions such as very mysterious make it sound. Uh, I think if you engage with it, you see that this is a significant extension. Uh, it is something that the International Court of Justice said consciously, but this didn't really sort of take international law to a new level where it had never been before. My second point is uh, perhaps anticlimactic, but also hopefully useful. Um, so if the Erga Omnis concept is not that dramatic after all, because something like that had existed before, perhaps then it is also not quite a revolution in another sense. Because it opens up the possibility of standing. The Gambias, Australias, Belgiums can bring proceedings where it's not clear how their individual matters and interests would have been affected by a breach of international law. But of course, this doesn't turn the ICJ into a court of general jurisdiction. And this is why the fears projected on the concept that this would lead to busybody litigation all across the globe are so completely misplaced. And again, I'm, I think my pattern for this lecture is that I'm refer back to something that Professor Alexander said in opening, um, international law remains premised, the jurisdiction of courts remains premised on consent. Standing will do nothing to consent. You need to establish the jurisdiction of the court, and only if that jurisdiction is established, you can litigate in the public interest. So the real hurdle, I think, to ICJ litigation for the public interest is not so much a narrow vision of standing, but a consensual basis of jurisdiction. So if we wonder why so many of the ills and evils of this world do not end up being litigated before the ICJ, standing is one explanation that states don't always bring proceedings. But the real explanation is absence of jurisdiction. It is not possible to sue Russia over the aggression against Ukraine, at least not in a claim based on the violation of Article 2.4. Russia has never consented to it. It is not possible to sue Israel over its conduct in the West Bank head-on on questions of territorial annexation or treatment of, let's say, status of the territory, because Israel 
has chosen not to accept the jurisdiction of the ICJ uh, in that matter. It is not possible to sue, let's say, the fishing nations of this world over uh, illegal, unlawful, and unreported fishing, because by and large, they tend not to accept the jurisdiction of the ICJ over such matters, and so on and so forth. Ergo omnis does nothing to that hurdle. It removes the obstacle of standing by broadening it, but it doesn't affect the consensual basis of the jurisdiction of the court. It does not affect, uh, does not do away with the problem that is posed by the need for consent to jurisdiction, and therefore, in itself, it's not. Uh, I mean, it's not a. It is a game changer for litigation in some ways, but it's not a world changer for the role of the ICJ, because the basic pillar, which is the pillar on which the ICJ's jurisdiction rests, for better or worse, jurisdiction consensualism remains. Um, so that is all I wanted to say on the core aspect. That is also perhaps why we have, despite a half century, not seen that many ergo omnis based cases before the ICJ. Um, Perhaps on a hopeful note, this may be changing. Uh, the Gambia's case is an obvious example, but if we're looking at the instances in which states have used the potential of Barcelona attraction, then even at a time when I wrote my doctorate, this was all hypothetical. Nowadays, we do have these cases, and I mentioned them again, Belgium's claim, the Gambia's claim, most obviously Australia's claim. It seems that states are gradually waking up belatedly to the potential that litigation on public interest matters uh, allows them uh, to, uh, that litigation uh, on public interest matters is, is possible because of the ergo omnis concept if jurisdiction is established, but it has been a long slumber and the concept is slow in realizing its potential. Um, so this is all I wanted to say on the first aspect, the first form of um, law enforcement, namely litigation before the International Court of Justice. Um, now, if we look back at a half century of discussion about obligations ergo omnis, and this is where I come to the second, of, the second half of my discussion, um, it seems very clear that obligations ergo omnis, while developed in the context of law enforcement, have not been restricted to that. Some see that as a genie that escapes from the bottle. Others see this as a, sort of a realization of a concept that while developed in the context of law enforcement, has its real role elsewhere. And let me focus on one other form of law enforcement, which is very different from judicial proceedings, but perhaps also affected by the ergo omnis concept. And that is the idea that the ergo omnis concept should also inform discussions about coercive law enforcement, law enforcement through countermeasures, where one state responds to the breach of, another, of international law by another state by taking a coercive measure that violates the rights of that initial wrongdoing state. And you see, if you've followed me so far, probably relatively clearly why this should be something that could be affected by the erga omnis concepts. The argument is that, look, if these rights are there for everybody, if all states have an interest in seeing them protected, and if all states can initiate proceedings to ensure their protection, why should they then not be able to also rely on other forms of law enforcement, um, namely take countermeasures? Now, the immediate response to that is obvious. This is not something that the ICJ could decide on. It decided on standing to sue, not the power to take countermeasures. And you could add to this, it's one thing to permit public interest litigation. It's quite another thing to permit public interest countermeasures. Perhaps this is a spillover. Perhaps the genie, once out of the bottle, stays out. But clearly, it's not something that can simply be assumed. The context is different. Countermeasures uh, denote the private coercive response. They are far more edgy, far more difficult to tolerate. Think of a few basic examples. And again, it may be in the bilateral context. A state breaches its cooperation treaty. Um, the other state then, in return, imposes tariffs. Both measures in and of themselves would violate international law, but because the initial breach 
has been committed, the second breach is tolerated and justified. Think of the frequent measures of imposing asset freezes on government ministers in response to unlawful conduct of those other states. This is a lot more controversial than suing another state before a court. And therefore, the policy implications are far wider of admitting that form of decentralized, coercive response in the public interest than there would be for litigation. But of course, international law in principle admits countermeasures. It has not reached the stage where private responses to wrongs are precluded. Uh, in principle, in the bilateral context, international law works with countermeasures. It tries to raise them in by requiring them to be proportionate, but they remain an option and they are seen as a tool for better or worse, of rendering international law a bit more effective. Um, now, the question that has been discussed, and again, it goes back to centuries, well before Barcelona traction, is whether states could take countermeasures, take coercive measures, to promote and protect public interests. Um, should that be accepted? Just imagine one of these examples, Japan, catching whale on the high seas. Um, Myanmar arguably or allegedly committing genocide and certainly mistreating a minority population. Should all states in the world be entitled to respond coercively because these are violations of obligations ergo omnis? Opinion on the matter has always been divided. Some see, in inverted commas, third party countermeasures as a way of protecting core interests of the international community effectively. Others, with much more uh, reason than in the field of judicial litigation, have warned about the abusive nature or the risk of abuse. Um, in, their, in their view, international law should limit coercion used by one state against another outside institutional frameworks. It shouldn't encourage it because it would lead to a justification of treaty suspensions, asset freezes, sanctions taken by private actors. This shouldn't be encouraged, even where it's for an arguable good cause. Now, these two opposing sentiments, are sort of seeing obligations, count, ergo omnis countermeasures as a vehicle towards greater effectiveness on the one hand, or emphasizing the risk of abuse, were clearly on display in what is in retrospect the most significant lawmaking context for this aspect in the debates of the International Law Commission on State Responsibility. And maybe to, uh, to end my talk, let me take you to the debates as they took place then. It's 20 years ago, but it remains the framework within which we discuss the lawfulness of third-party countermeasures. Um, in the ILC debates, the commissioners discussed the regime governing countermeasures. So the question of erga omnis countermeasures came up. Um, there was quite a lot of practice. Um, many thought that there was quite a significant practice of states doing what the ergo omnis concept might encourage them to do, namely responding to breaches of international law through countermeasures, even where they were not individually effective. And I would think there is a weighty body of practice now. Since the 1970s in particular, states have quite frequently suspended treaties, frozen foreign assets, withheld economic aid in violation of treaties in order to put pressure on states that were accused of violation of obligations ergo omnis, notably in the human rights field. Responses against South Africa during the apartheid era are one example, but there are many more. Um, typically, such uh, ergo omnis countermeasures are part of an overall strategy, where you always also try to put diplomatic pressure, where you al also initiate institutional initiatives at the UN and elsewhere. But the practice does exist. I remember in, in my uh, work, this is now long ago, I had sort of 20 or so cases in which states very clearly had asserted a right to disregard their own obligations in order to put pressure on a state that was violating obligations ergo omnis. Since then, I'm sure there's 20 more. And in the current debate about Ukraine and Russia, we see a resurgence of third party or third state responses, asset freezes on Russian dignitaries or oligarchs, um, freezing of assets of central banks uh, that are not justified institutionally within the UN context. The special uh, feature, of course, is that this is in response to an act of aggression 
But the idea is very clear that decentralized coercive responses are one way uh, for states to respond to a breach of international law that is considered egregious and manifest and fundamental. Um, so I would and have always argued that there's a sufficient amount of practice to permit or to recognize the right of states to take countermeasures in response to established systematic and widespread breaches of obligations ergo omnis. This was also a view taken by the Institut de Droit International, the Institute of International Law in 2006. But matters have remained controversial and perhaps for good reasons. Critics, as I've said, have said um, that there was a risk of abuse, but also that the states that do this are always Western states or powerful states, and this shouldn't be encouraged. Practice was too selective um, and insufficient to modify the rules. When the International Law Commission that I mentioned um, tried to sort of boil down this into, a sort of, into, an, into an actionable rule, it chose to err on the side of caution some of you may be familiar with the text on state responsibility. It has many strange provisions. The most strangest one is probably Article 54, which contains uh, a holding, a holdout, or sort of a safeguard clause with respect to the topic I'm just talking about, uh, third-party countermeasures. It does not encourage such measures. It does not rule them out. It leaves the matter open. It says that states can take lawful measures in response to established breaches of obligations ergo omnis, but it doesn't say whether countermeasures qualify as such lawful measures. It is a very fudgy compromise, um, which many have criticized, but on the other hand, um, at the time uh, in 2001, the text needed to be adopted and you needed to minimize um, exposure and controversy. So in the overarching interests of getting a text on state responsibility approved by consensus, the International Law Commission chose to dodge this crucial issue, which many have cared about, me included. Um, a curious compromise, if you want, that has enabled everybody to agree to disagree. Um, understandable, perhaps. So if we step back, and with this I'll conclude, um, then it seems to me that the debate about countermeasures in response to um, uh, violations of obligations ergo omnis perhaps reflect the wider approach of the international community to this fascinating, mysterious, strange topic. Um, it's an intriguing concept that clearly has considerable potential, and that's what I think everybody recognizes. Um, but it's still unclear how exactly it could be used. And in that sense, Ian Brownlee, 20, 30 years ago, was right that it is mysterious. He was not right otherwise. It's not very complicated. But there's uncertainty about the precise implications of what it means for an obligation to be owed ergo omnis in the case of its breach. Now, to return to my starting point, I hope that otherwise you agree with me that it's not so complicated. The terminology is unnecessarily old-fashioned. We should choose, we should try to write our international law without Latin. Uh, I would say, having studied Latin at school. Um, it's unnecessarily complicated. The, the hesitation that international scholars bring to it and talking about it makes it sound more complicated. Students are afraid of the term. None of this is helpful. It's a, it's a straightforward proposition that for certain fundamental obligations, all states outside, outside the bilateral context should have a right to intervene to defend the public interest. That straightforward proposition is clearly now accepted when it comes to the mode of law enforcement through judicial proceedings, where the stakes, you might say, are low. That proposition, that straightforward proposition, is not yet clearly accepted when we're looking at the more controversial form of law enforcement, countermeasures. And perhaps there's reason to be cautious. Um, but the way obligations ergo omnis function is always the same. You move from the idea that international law is applied and enforced between pairs of states to a general interest, to a public interest in seeing it observed and enforced. That is how obligations ergo omnis, despite the curious naming, uh, have uh, functioned and have been understood since the 3rd of February 1970, when the court rendered its bizarre Barcelona traction judgment. That's how we should understand with them 
we should need to cut through the mysteriousness or the mystery that allegedly uh, surrounds the concept and need to engage in a clear-eyed way uh, with the very real issues that would flow from a recognition of international litigation and the public interest in defense of obligations ergo omnes, or even so um, the recognition of a right to take countermeasures in response to breaches of obligations ergo omnes. Obligations ergo omnes in the half century that has passed since that strange judgment have not transformed international law in the way that Judge Cansado Trindade, in my opening quote, may have hoped for or may still hope for. But this is clearly not an empty gesture. It's a concept that is taken to be taken seriously, to be engaged with, and with of which no one, not even a first-year student, should be afraid of. That's all I wanted to share with you. I look forward to our discussion, and I'm grateful for your patience. Many thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Christian J. Tams, for the comprehensive uh, uh, insights into enforcement of obligation ergonomics. Uh, for the participants, if you have any questions to ask or uh, direct it directly to the professor, or you can post it in the chat box, uh, I'll uh, ask the questions to the resource person. Yeah, Lily, you have something to ask. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, do you think that the ICJ must potentially water down the consent? Um, consent is being a prerequisite for jurisdiction in order to allow more uh, like ergo omnes proceedings to even take place at the ICJ. Atul, may I ask, do you want me to respond right away or do you want to collect? I'm, I'm happy either way. Yeah, I'll just uh, uh, paraphrase whatever she asked. Uh, if, uh, yeah. So her question was basically, Professor, whether consent, uh, how to overcome, uh, how to overcome consent in the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice in the context of erga omnes obligation. If I'm right, that is the question she wanted to ask. You. Yeah, yeah, no, no, and I think it's a good question. Thank you, Liji, um, for that question. I think, I mean, my my response is perhaps drawing on experience in in litigation before the ICJ. I don't think the ICJ will overcome consent. Uh, it is too ingrained in the fabric of that institution uh, or of, and the expectations of litigants appearing before the ICJ. I think what the ICJ may do um, is creatively construe the scope of consent given by states. And this is something that has often been the case, um, uh, now not necessarily in the field of obligations or omnis, but as a general matter. So if you think, I mean, the, the landmark cases, the Nicaragua case brought against the US in retrospect a judgment that is un unforgettable and significant and a landmark in whatever way you look at it. But perhaps with 40, 35 years of distance, we can recognize that it was a bit of a stretch to construe jurisdiction in the way the ICJ did, interpreting the US consent uh, so that it could render judgment. Perhaps one day we will look at the very dramatic uh, process that is now pending before the ICJ between Ukraine and Russia and the new case brought just last month in response to the aggression against Ukraine, where the ICJ and the provisional measures order seemed, let's say, put it mildly, relatively liberal in construing Russia's consent, uh, the scope of Russia's consent under the Genocide Convention to render a provisional measures order that seemed to perhaps be broader than some um, followers or, if you want, ardent, um, ardent observers of the ICJ might have expected. I think that's the modus operandi not dispense with consent, uh, not to do away with it, but where you have it uh, on, on occasion construed broadly. Now, you asked about, of course, uh, erga omnes, not just general approaches to consent. And I think my gut feeling there would be, but it's perhaps just a hunch, that in cases implicating um, attested uh, breaches of obligations erga omnes, that desire, that willingness to construe consent broadly to overcome limitations may be particularly pronounced. Um, this is just uh, a gut feeling um, and, it's not, uh, and it's not sort of a given, so you cannot rely on this, but my, my sense is that where, where the, on the merits a case cries out for a judicial pronouncement, the court will be willing, as we would all be, to not be overly technical on the construction of consent. Um, that's all I would say for now, which I think, do you see, um, perhaps, Liji, that my response is less an erga omnis response than one that comes from 
my, like if you want my general experience with uh, as a scholar and 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 part-time practitioner uh, in in arguing before the court and from the court's general approach to the question of consent many thanks uh, thank you professor thams for that uh, there is a question by q huang so if you could go ahead please uh, shoot your question uh, to professor thams right huang ah uh, yeah hi christian a uh, uh, I have the question about uh, what you mentioned about the countermeasure. Because when we look at the case of ICJ, the agronomists are mostly concerned about the jurisdiction, like whether they have standing to sue. But i just wondering, do you think the international judiciary, uh, like the judges in ICJ, they will ha have such an intention to expand uh, the agar omis into substantial issue like we know i, I don't know at this stance like there's so many countries take the economic sanction on russia whether they are justification or built on agar omis or other other convention or, or, or anything but if the judges or uh the practice or the ac academy they reach a consensus that the agar omis uh the obligation can be extended to not only uh jurisdiction but also to substantial issue maybe it will create uh such a result that the country will bypass the peace conflict resolution and they will take uh the sanction or countermeasure to some country, they think they violated uh, the obligation to all. So I, I don't know whether it's a good way for uh, the value that United Nations Charter that always pursue the peaceful conflict resolution. Yes, I mean, thank you, Shishi. And it's good to hear you uh, in, in this forum. Uh, so I think, I mean, look, what you have uh, put to us is, is essentially sort of the, I think, a plausible, persuasive case for why we shouldn't rush into extending ergo omnis effects into fields where the measures that are at stake are controversial and perhaps conducive to not uh, sort of conducive to um, conducive to sort of increasing and exacerbating tensions. Uh, I think that is that is a downside. This is why I said if we're comparing the two measures that I was looking at, litigation and countermeasures, for litigation, I see no policy case against extending it because there is no risk of, I mean, there's no, no real risk of abuse. And even if states were to rush to the court to bring all sorts of public, just imagine if alongside Gambia, 10 other states uh, sued Myanmar before the ICJ. Yeah, I mean, you could say it, we need coordination, we need perhaps cost efficiency, we would need ways of sort of ensuring that these cases don't proceed in parallel, um, and we would need a rule against double recovery if we're looking at reparations, but that can all be handled. For countermeasures, it's a lot trickier because the stakes are higher, and, and I think your statement brings that out, and there's the risk that a, a countermeasure taken against the wrongdoing state uh, will exacerbate tensions. So I think... Um, I have, so I have no principled response to say that you're wrong or you're reading. You have, you have a point. The only question is that, of course, we need to balance your point, I think, with the uh, sort of the opposing view that permitting effective responses is part of what international law needs. International law has an absence of effective responses to wrongfulness. And perhaps, um, if you want, permitting some more of them not just uh, through unilateralism and anarchy, but in relation to a concept that international law recognizes, obligations ergo omnis, then that is not altogether bad. We need to balance the increase of effective responses versus the risk of abuse. Um, I think there are two points I would make perhaps in, in suggesting how we would strike that balance. Um, one is that um, I think the the best way forward would be to craft a rule whereby such responses um, are only permitted in response to well-attested, systematic, and wide, widespread breaches of obligations or omnis. So not each and every case. Um, I think the key is, as with all countermeasures, that unless you have an attestation of the wrong by an objective um, institution, you will always have 
international law applied between pairs of states or groups of states. But I think insistence on widespread, systematic and attested violations would be one attempt to deal with the risk of abuse. I would make one other comment which slightly goes beyond, but which I think vindicates your general point. I've spoken about two forms, litigation and countermeasures. I've purposefully not spoken about another form of responding to breaches of international law, namely by using force. At some point, people were trigger happy, people were encouraging, uh, were saying that if an obligation erga omnis is violated, this should give a right to uh, sort of a right of states to use force in response. Um, I don't think anybody seriously discusses that because when it comes to forcible responses, the risk of abuse is paramount and nobody wants to weaken the international law. Pro well, some people do want to weaken the international law prohibitions against force, but the argument that you could respond to a breach of an ergo omnis obligation by, by responding with forcible measures is a non-starter. Nobody seriously argues for that. So I think with respect to that form of response, uh, Shishi, your argument wins the day. Um, with respect to countermeasures, I think it requires a balancing. So that's all I would want to say in response. Many thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the uh, detailed explanation to the question. Uh, you ha anyone else having any questions, you can post, post it to Professor or you can put it in the chat box. Uh, in continuation to what Professor Tams had uh, uh, I mean, articulated, I, I have a question to Professor Tams regarding uh, the core uh, aspect that was discussed. Now, I was going through some of the cases in the ICJ. The World Court seems to uh, favor the argument of erga omnis parties rather or over erga omnis obligation uh, in uh, I mean, stricto sensu. So whether uh, the World Court has leaned in favor of erga omnis parties, that is, if only if uh, a state is party to a treaty, uh, will erga omnis obligation plea? be accepted by the world court this is because in the belgium the uh, the uh, uh, habre case uh, you, you were mentioning mm -hmm. it was for, it was through the torture convention uh, the world court had taken up the uh, jurisdiction if i'm right and in the gambia myanmar it was through the genocide convention mm -hmm. so are we seeing more of ergonomous parties rather than ergonomous obligation independently thank you i mean i think that's a good question and it's good partly because it makes me realize what I didn't say in the talk and should have said. Uh, so I think you're right. Uh, this is a, um, I think you're right in your observation and I think you're right in bringing it up. So in response, let me perhaps just sort of for the benefit of the, the, um, the ones for whom the terminology is confusing, just say that there is indeed this curious dichotomy. We have obligations ergo omnis in the way the ICJ mentioned them in Barcelona Attraction. Um, obligations owed to all. Um, and then we have almost as an afterthought, the idea that under treaty regimes, the obligation wouldn't be owed to all in a literal sense, all other states, but to all treaty parties. And that then becomes translated into erga omnes partes, and because it's Latin and sounds fancy, everybody uses it. Um, so I, I think that's the, but I think the mechanism would always be the same, that uh, you generalize standing, you recognize the legal interest of all parties or all states in uh, general international law in, the, in, seeing, a, in seeing an obligation uh, observed. Um, I think you're right to say that in the ICJ, um, obligations erga omnes partis in the cases that have come up have dominated. Um, I think the only point where I would diverge is that I don't see this as uh, a move away from Obli obligations erga omnis stricto sensu, as you said, the, the truly general obligation. I think it's a question of um, opportunity. Uh, and I, I think if you look at the jurisdictional structures of the ICJ, hardly any case turns on customary international law outside optional clause declaration cases. Because in so many cases, jurisdiction is based on compromissory clauses where you have to allege the breach of a treaty. And you've given us three examples, the Whaling Convention, the Anti-Torture Convention, and the Genocide Convention. So the breach is then, in, in the bulk of ICJ litigation, you allege treaty breaches. So erga omnes stricto sensu, in your sense, um, doesn't play a role simply because the debate is about the treaty terms. Um, as this is so, 
most public interest litigation before the ICJ will be about treaty breaches, where if you want to use the term, we're talking about obligations erga omnis partis. Um, my view is that the two are perhaps more closely coordinated and, and, and mutually reinforcing uh, than uh, your question implies, where there seems to be a, a dichotomy. So I would see uh, both as part of the same logic of permitting public, in, public interest litigation on the basis of the vindication of certain fundamental values. Um, and it just happens to be erga omnis partis if it's treaty based and it's erga omnis without partis if it's general international law based. So I would see any judgment that reinforces the erga omnis partis prohibition that say of the torture convention as being applicable by analogy to uh, related arguments under general international law. And I wouldn't read into it a choice that the court makes. But I agree with you to conclude on, on that note because my, my disagreement is 1% and my agreement is 99%. But I agree with you and, and find it helpful as a clarification because I skipped it in my talk. I agree with you that the International Court of Justice jurisprudence to the extent that it has, it has embraced the concept has done through, through the prism of treaties and in the treaty context where these obligations are properly then referred to as erga omnis partis. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for that, for, for a comprehensive, uh, uh, I mean, <clears throat> uh, co I mean, com uh, I mean, thank you for that answer, Professor. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll take one more question before we officially uh, conclude this session, if uh, that is fine with you, Professor. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. So there is a question that is asked by my colleague for health reasons. He was unable to attend today's session, but uh, he wanted to, but because of health reasons, he couldn't. He wanted to ask Professor uh, uh, whether, th whether the state uh, intervening before the ICJ, what we call a third party intervention, uh, in case of third in a third party intervention, whether states could argue erga omnis obligation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So towards the end, we get all the, the difficult questions. You know, I think all questions were, were good and difficult, but thank you for, for forwarding that. Um, so I think um, the question that your colleague um, raised and which you've posed to me, I think, um, to some extent, um, puts us into uncharted territory. But I think, uh, because we have relatively little ju judicial pronouncements on that, but I think um, it's uncharted territory that need not frighten us, because we, um, th there's nothing looming there um, that, that we should be afraid of. So third party intervention. In the ICJ, it works under two provisions, Article 62 and 63. Article 63, we don't need erga omnis obligations. Intervention there is permitted for all treaty parties. So if you want, it's a bit like erga omnis partis. If you're a treaty party to the convention that is being litigated before the ICJ, you can intervene. You don't need to show anything beyond that. So in some ways, the intervention provision does what elsewhere with respect to standing as a litigant, the erga omnis partis concept does for you. So I think you, you could rely on erga omnis partis if you wanted to, but you don't have to because the text of the statute permits interventions by all treaty parties. They have just historically never chosen to do so, well, hardly ever chosen to do so. Um, so that deals with Article 63 interventions where I think it's not necessary. It's trickier for Article 62 interventions, uh, which are outside the treaty context where you can intervene as a third party if, you're, if you show an interest in doing so. Um, for that sense, I think um, the erga omnis concept does lend weight to the argument that you should be able to intervene. Uh, the cases that are currently in the pipeline in litigation, uh, perhaps that there's the legations that uh, the Netherlands and Canada will intervene in the Gambia litigation against Myanmar, they might be testing this proposition. It seems to me, uh, for two reasons, we need to be, we need not be afraid. One is that I think, um, is it two reasons or one? Let me think. <laughs> I think for, uh, so for two, perhaps for two reasons, we need not be afraid. One is that I think the argument by, um, I think it would be implied. If, if the ICJ recognizes, um, I mean, if, if sort of, if my reading put to you is the, convincing one, that you can even bring proceedings because of the erga omnis character of the obligation at stake, then it would seem difficult to me to say that you couldn't then also intervene. Um, if, the, if the barrier for intervention was higher, uh, 
than the barrier for the institution of proceedings, I think we would look at a rather curious system. So I think this isn't, the matter hasn't been decided, but I would think that reliance on the erga omnis concept to justify intervention would be pretty safe and convincing as an argumentative strategy. And I would not really see a court that is serious about the ergo omnis concept um, uh, be able to get out of it and say, ergo omnis is good enough to found standing, but not good enough to found a third party intervention. So that's the first reason why I think your colleague is on a safe track. The second is that it's, it's a big question in the literature uh, that's often been discussed because we have those two forms. It's not sort of init initiating litigation and intervening as a third party. It seems to me the interest, uh, I mean, we don't have that many cases. I, I said states are waking up to the possibility, um, but it's still early days, despite the fact that this judgment is 50 years old. It seems to me that as states are waking up, and as they are exceptionally making use of the possibilities of the ergo omnis or ergo omnis partis concept, um, if I were advising a state, I would always encourage them to sue rather than to intervene. Um, if you're taking the step of confronting another state in a judicial forum of the world court with its breaches of international law, and if the issues are of such fundamental nature, then you're making lots of policy choices. Um, you're going for public litigation as opposed to quiet diplomacy. You're, um, you're choosing a big forum. If you do all that, then it seems to me the more attractive route is to litigate and initiate litigation as opposed to joining existing litigation. Um, and this is why I think, my hope is that as the concept is gaining contours, is being picked up, up uh, my hope is always that your colleague's question becomes irrelevant because states do it as litigants as opposed to as interveners. That to me seems um, the more appropriate course and the better way of filling this concept that has been with us for 50 plus years with concrete meaning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor, for a comprehensive answer. Uh, I think we uh, would conclude with this. Uh, before going into the official word of thanks, uh, I would like to, uh, again, extend my uh, warm thanks to Professor Christian Thames. I, I understand that his schedule is, uh, is too busy, a professor. Uh, when, I, when I contacted him in the month of Feb, uh, I mean, uh, his, I hope that his schedule is jam-packed. So uh, thank you, Professor, for accepting our invitation in the first place. Uh, thank you for that. And we, uh, we also would like to collaborate in the near future. Uh, with other incentives, uh, with uh, hopefully with your center at the University of Glasgow, we would also like to love to pitch in uh, with our contributions in international law. And uh, once all this COVID and things uh, uh, comes down, we would also like to personally invite you to our beautiful campus at Calcutta in India. And of course, uh, to Christ University, uh, which is located in Bangalore. And in person, we would like love to interact with you uh, to know the nuances of international law. Uh, so I would, uh, again, uh, before going into the official uh, word of thanks, I uh, would like to thank the, uh, uh, one of the directors of uh, HILSA, uh, the student director, Mehul Jain, uh, for running uh, from pillar to post, preparing this brochure uh, more than once. And I would also like to thank the uh, uh, student advisors from uh, the uh, Christ University Bangalore for uh, putting up such uh, such a such a st academically uh, stimulating event. I hope all the participants would have benefited a lot from the legal scholarship, uh, which was disseminated by uh, a doyen in international law, Pro Professor Christian Tams. Uh, I hope that. Uh, uh, we could maintain this collaboration in the near future too, uh, in that kind of engagement with uh, international law. And do let us know if uh, your university is organizing events. We would like to love to participate. Thank you, Professor. Now I, I hand it over to Mehul and the representative from the Christ University for the official vote of thanks. Thank you so much, Professor, again. Thank you. Yeah, um, Liji and Lekha, if you could please proceed with the concluding remarks. Uh, thank you. At, at the outset, uh, I'm Liji, uh, the co-convener of the ALSA chapter at uh, SLCU. Uh, 
Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Professor Dams for taking our time and sort of giving us a bird's eye view of how autonomous obligations and its enforcement uh, issues that could come up and um, all the insights that were gathered throughout. And we were particularly sort of interested in uh, you explaining us the enforcement issues and how that related to cases and uh, we are very eternally grateful for your time. Yeah. Um, specifically on how ERGA um, owners' obligations can be implemented at the ICJ, sir. When you were telling us about like strategies that could potentially be used at the ICJ, I sort of set uh, this lecture apart from like most of the lectures that we have in public international law in India. So we thank you a lot for uh, taking time out to be with us today. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Tams, for accepting our invitation uh, for the first NUJS SLCU annual ILSA lecture. And uh, we hope to host you on, physically on our campuses once uh, we are able to do so. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the student conveners of the Christ University in Bangalore, Liji and Lekha, for uh, cooperating with us and helping us so much which resulted in this collaboration between our university and Christ University. And this collaboration has not only helped us further the objectives of uh, the NUJS and Christ University ILSA chapters, but also the but also the objective of ILSA as an organization as whole, which is to further the dissemination and further discussion in the field of public international law. So I'd like to thank all participants for attending and raising such pertinent questions. And once again, thank you all for being a part of this lecture. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Liji. Thank you, Mehul. Thank you, Atul Alexander. It's been a pleasure and privilege. Thank you. Thank you.